Hello everyone, um, thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Nora, I'm a fifth year medical student and I'm going to present the first part of the talk. Um, so that will include strokes and headaches and then my colleagues will take over and do the rest. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout the, the presentation, please do just speak up or write any, something in the chat. Uh, this is, you know, your opportunity to have any questions answered. So we're more than happy to help you out. So I'll just get started. So a stroke, uh, this is a great definition, I think, is a rapid onset focal neurological deficit due to a vascular lesion lasting longer than 24 hours. And I think this is a great definition because it summarizes everything you really have to know about strokes when it comes to fifth, uh, no, fourth year, sorry. So uh, rapid onset. Um, so you wanna, when the patient first presents, there are two scoring systems that are used. ROSIER, it stands for rule out of stroke in ER. So rule out stroke in ER, that's ROSIER. And it's used in a ho hospital set setting to, uh, to sort of score the likelihood of the person having a stroke. It's used to distinguish between suspe suspected stroke and other mimics like a hemiplegic uh, migraine or a seizure. And um, a stroke is likely if the score is more than zero. All right, so um, it would be useful if you Google Rosier score on uh, Google and you can see the um, what scores your point and what deducts a point. And then of course, fast, we've all learned these, this. It's used more of a, in a community setting and it stands for face, arm, speech, and time. So yeah, any symptoms of uh, face, arm, uh, weakness, or disturbances in speech, uh, get them to the hospital within, uh, you know, in time, get them urgently to hospital. Uh, treatment for stroke is normally um, thrombolysis because most strokes are ischemic. They're not hemorrhagic. 85% of strokes are caused by a thrombus or embolus blocking an artery in the, in the brain. So if the patient presents within four and a half hours, you want to give them IV alteplase so they can be thrombolyzed and then blood flow will will go to the affected blood will flow to the affected area and hopefully there won't be too much of a disability if the patient presents within 6 hours thrombectomy mechanical thrombectomy can be an option uh, to treat the patient uh, given that it's a neurological condition you want to do an urgent ct head when they present this has to be a non contrast ct because there's a uh, if it's contrast, then you can damage the brain because the contrast can leak out if it's a uh, hemorrhagic stroke, for example. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, most strokes are ischemic. Uh, some are hemorrhagic, uh, but yeah, most of the time they're ischemic. And they have to last longer than 24 hours because um, TIA is a stro stroke mimic. TIA stands for transient ischemic attack, which is just a transient uh, block, uh, uh, block of the blood basically. Um, it's not the same as stroke and it's treated differently, so it's important to rule out uh, TIA. So an important thing to, um, an important concept of stroke medicine is localization, and this involves guessing which artery was affected um, in the stroke by looking at the clinical presentation of the patient. So um, you can, of course, do imaging to determine which, um, which ar uh, artery was affected. Uh, but you can also sort of guess which artery is affected by how the patient presents um, in the ER. So the way I like to do it is I like to split the blood supply to the brain into two major, major circulations. You have the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. The anterior circulation is made up of the internal carotid artery, all right, um, is the branches of the internal carotid artery. So that, that includes the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. What does the, the anterior cir circulation supply? It supplies everything in the cerebrum apart from the occipital lobe. So you get, it supplies the front, frontal lobes, the frontal lobes, sorry, the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes, okay? So a uh, stroke in the anterior circulation will affect the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. This means that you will get symptoms of frontal lobe dysfunction, temporal lobe dysfunction, or parietal lobe dysfunction, as well as symptoms of uh, motor weakness, because the motor homunculus is found in between the frontal and the parietal lobes, um, and the temporal lobe, sorry. And then a third symptom that presents in anterior circulation strokes is um, visual symptoms. Um, this might not be as obvious, 
because um, but the reason why you get visual symptoms is because there's visual pathways running from the eyes to the occipital lobe um, through these lobes basically so you have the Myers loop loop and the Baum's loop and they connect the information that the eye processes and it connects it to the visual cortex so back in the back of the brain, right, the occipital lobe. So if there's a damage in the anterior circulation, you'll damage either the Myers loop or the Bounds loop. And this means that you'll get either quadrantonopia or homonymous hemianopia, which we've all heard of, right? So anterior strokes will present with three core symptoms. Motor symptoms, because you damage the motor homunculus. Um, cortical symptoms, we call them cortical symptoms, so they're the specialist symptoms that each lobe is, is um, controlled. So the frontal lobe, you have Broca's area, so you'll get Broca's aphasia. Um, in parietal lobe damage, you'll have things like apraxia, neglect, ag agraphia. And then uh, in the temporal lobe, you have Wernicke's uh, area, so you'll get Wernicke's aphasia, okay? Um, and then the third symptom is visual symptoms, so either quadrantinopia or hemianopia. The posterior circulation um, are, the, are the branches of the vertebral arteries, which join together to form the basilar artery. And the posterior uh, circulation supplies everything else that is not supplied by the anterior circulation. So that includes the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. So, um, Stroke in the posterior circulation will cause occipital lobe symptoms, which is homonymous hemianopia um, with macular sparing specifically. If it's homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing, then it's an occipital lobe dysfunction, and that's caused by a posterior artery or posterior circulation stroke. Okay. If you have um, a posterior circulation stroke, you can also damage the cerebellum, which will present with the classic Danish symptoms, right? And then damage to the brainstem will cause a myriad of symptoms. You have to learn about Wallenberg and Weber syndrome. I'll, I'll uh, expand on that a bit later. Okay, um, so all this information that I just mentioned was summarized in the Oxford classification. So again, there's uh, the anterior strokes. They can either be total anterior strokes or partial anterior strokes. There's the posterior circulation strokes. And then there's another subtype called a lacunar stroke. I'll just quickly expand on lacunar strokes because lacunar strokes are the most common types of strokes. They are strokes of the small branches that come off the main arteries that supply the brain. And because these are very small arteries, they're very easy to block right? The smaller the artery, the more easy to block. So lacunar strokes are the most common. And these small arteries supply the very deep structures in the brain. So you have the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the internal capsule, all these deep structures are supplied by these small penetrating arteries. So uh, a stroke in these small arteries will cause um, specific symptoms um, like, uh, hum you know, uh, pure motor symptoms in half of the body, um, pure sensory symptoms in half of the body, but there will be no cortical symptoms. So no Broca's aphasia, no Wernicke's aphasia, nothing like neglect, right? Because that's an anterior circulation stroke um, affecting big arteries. So if you have pure motor symptoms in half of the body, but nothing else, then it's more likely to be a lacunar stroke affecting, for example, the internal capsule. A posterior circulation uh, stroke, we've mentioned, it's, it can affect the occipital lobe, it can affect the cerebellum, it can affect the brainstem. And then anterior strokes, I mentioned it was either the middle cerebral artery or the anterior cerebral artery, the, the artery supplying the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes and the parietal lobes. You'll get motor symptoms because of the damage to motor homunculus. You'll get visual symptoms due to the damage to the Meyer and Baum's loop, and you get specific symptoms relating to damage to the, fit, to the frontal lobe, for example, etc. Um, partial and the way I like to distinguish between total and partial is partial is basically 
a blockage of a smaller branch. It's not the smaller, the smallest branch, like in lacuna stroke, but it's a smaller branch. So partial, it will be affecting a smaller branch of the main artery supplying the brain, whereas a total anterior stroke is a bigger artery is affected. So there's more damage. So you'll have all of the three symptoms um, of anterior strokes, um, whereas in partial, you'll have only two of the three symptoms. So um, this is a question. Uh, so a 52 year old man is admitted to the vascular ward for an amputation. He complains of unsteadiness. On further examination, you detect right facial numbness and right sided nystagmus, and there is sensory loss of the, on the left side. This is a difficult question if you haven't learned about brainstem strokes, but um, I'll just tell you the answer now because it will allow me to expand further on brainstem strokes. So any question where there is incongruence between facial symptoms and uh, body symptoms, you know it's it's definitely a brainstem stroke because the cranial nerves in, innervate the ipsilateral side of the face and the motor tracts travel to the contralateral side of the body. So uh, in this exa example, for example, we have a right facial numbness right in the face, but then you have sensory loss in the left side. So there's incongruence between the face and the body. So that's definitely a brainstem. Um, then there's also um, specific cranial nerve symptoms. So you have, um, where is it again? Yeah, right-sided nystagmus. So this is a, 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 speaks to Wallenberg syndrome, which can be remembered by the acronym DANVA. And basically you get symptoms of brainstem stroke um, plus cranial nerve dysfunction. So the cranial nerves um, found in the medulla are the last four cranial nerves. So you'll have dysfunction of cranial nerves 8, 9, 10, no, sorry, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And that's why you get nystagmus. Um, you'll also get um, loss of sensation in the palate and the muscles of the, and the, and the pharynx, for example, because that's innervated by the 9, 10, 11, 12 um, cranial nerves. But the main symptoms that you have to remember are these uh, Danva, basically, so dysarthia, ataxia, nystagmus, vertigo, and that's just something you have to know, unfortunately. I could go further into why this happens, but it's such a long explanation, I think it'll take too much time. Um, so these are just the major strokes uh, that you, you sort of have to know about. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about anything other than Wallenberg and uh, Weber's, but if you're keen, you can read about the others. So management is really important to know when it comes to stroke. First of all, you want to make sure that, that, that the patient is stable. So you want to do an A to E examination on them. Um, the, after that, you do a, a acute stroke management. So you want to do an urgent CT head, non-contrast. Um, it's important to mention, I just mentioned this quickly, the best, the most sensitive test for stroke, ischemic stroke, is a diff diffuse DWI MRI. It's a diffusion weighted imaging MRI, but it's impossible to get that on the NHS, so it's impractical. The, way, the reason why that's best is because ischemic strokes won't necessarily show up acutely on CT head because there are no changes that can be detected normally acutely um, in an ischemic stroke. Uh, but yeah, so you do an urgent CT head mostly to rule out hemorrhagic stroke or a brain bleed or another um, pathology in the brain. Because um, if it's a brain bleed, no, if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, sorry, you don't want to apply the ischemic treatment. You want to rule out uh, a hemorrhagic stroke. And then if there's no bleed, then you can do an ischemic stroke protocol. So uh, once you've, conf conf uh, you've done the CT and there's nothing really obvious, then you s sort of can deduce that it's an ischemic stroke. Then you'd want to confirm it by doing an urgent CT angi angiogram. And then if it's a large artery occlusion, so a total artery circulation stroke, for example, then you want to do IV thrombolysis within four and a half hours, or you can do a thrombectomy within six hours. Um, and if 
If it's not a large artery occlusion, then you can just do an, um, a thrombolysis. The reason why thrombectomy is sometimes uh, recommended for large artery occlusion is be because it has really good outcomes for the patients. Then um, after you've done thrombolysis, you want to repeat the CT for 24 hours to make sure there's not been a malignant transformation or hemorrhagic transformation. Where um, So you're promoting bleeding in the patient because you, you don't want the clot to be be in the brain. So that means that the patient can develop bleeding after giving the thrombolysis. So you want to repeat the CT at 24 hours to make sure that they're not bleeding. And then you can give them um, aspirin. A hemorrhagic stroke, there's nothing really that you can do other than a neurosurgical review. Um, you want to admit them to a hyperacute stroke unit. You can give them you want to stop anticoagulants if they're on them. So if you, if they're on warfarin, you want to give them bariplex, optoplex. It's um, yeah, the, the thing that stops warfarin from working basically. Um, you want to make sure that the bl blood pressure is controlled. So you want to make sure that the blood pressure is between 120 and 140. Um, um, and then yeah, the the only definitive management that's available is. Um, is neurosurgical review, so hemicraniectomy or coiling. Okay. So um, here we have another question. So 72-year-old woman with past uh, history of treated hypertension presents for review. Yesterday she had a two-hour episode where she couldn't find the right word when speaking. These symptoms have now fully resolved. This has never happened before and there have been no associated features. Neurological examination is unremarkable and blood pressure was 150 over 100. Her current medication is amlodipine. What is the most appropriate management? So this patient has hypertension and has a t had a two hour episode where she couldn't find the right word. So a uh, sort of neuro focal neurological symptom lasting less than 24 hours. We suspect a TIA, transient ischemic attack. Um, this is a subtype of ischemic stroke, which is brought on by transient decrease in blood flow. It lasts less than 24 hours by definition, but normally it resolves within one hour. That's the most common presentation. If anything, like it lasts less than a few minutes, only a few minutes of neurological um, symptoms. Um, so in these patients, what you want to do is um, you want to give them aspirin and then you want to review them within 24 hours. Um, there used to be, there's another slide coming up where you used to do an ABCD2 score on them to determine when they should be reviewed, whether it sh they should be re reviewed within a week or 24 hours. But now best practice is 24 hours always. Uh, so yeah, this is transient ischemic attack. Um, as I said, last less than 24 hours, but normally or most of them resolve within a few minutes or less than an hour. Um, this ABCD2 score is to, used to determine when they should be reviewed, uh, whether they should be reviewed within four hours, no, uh, within a, a week or 24 hours. Uh, but this isn't really used now. Um, and yeah, the treatment is aspirin. Um, yeah, if if they have like an embolic cause, like if they have atrial fibrillation, for example, then you can give them clopidogel, which is used to, um, yeah, um, prevent strokes, basically. Okay, so 60-year-old woman um, has suffered three episodes of transient right monocular blindness. Her rate, uh, her rate is 88 beats per minute and she is in sinus rhythm, which is the single most appropriate investigation that would diagnose the condition. So the answer for this is C, because um, this describes transient monocular blindness, uh, which is considered a TIA originated in, ori originating in the carotid arteries. And it must be managed the same as a transient ischemic attack involving the brain or, um, yeah. So this always is caused by um, a carotid artery stenosis and if if the stenosis is significant so more than 70 percent then you would want to do a carotid and arterectomy as well so a more long-term management of stroke so first of all you want to do 
primary um, prevention. So you want to remove the, any triggers of the stroke. If they have, for example, atrial fibrillation, then you want to give them um, anticoagulants uh, like rivaroxaban or warfarin. Um, but this is only once you've calculated their CHAD, CHADS2 VASC2 score. Um, so if the CHADS2 VASC2 score is more than one in females, then you want to anticoagulate them. And if it's more than zero in males, then you want to anticoagulate them. Um, so that's one cause of stroke. Another cause of stroke is carotid stenosis. Or, yeah. uh, so if they have an ultrasound which reveals significant stenosis, then you want to do a carotid endarterectomy. So that's primary prevention. They have something causing that st the stroke that you've proven that is, it causes it, um, and you're stopping that from causing more strokes. Secondary prevention uh, re relates more to like lifestyle modifications and more long-term um, risk management. Um, so I like to remember it by the acronym HALTS. So H stands for hypertension control. So uh, you want to start them on ACE inhibitors within two days. Um, A stands for antiplatelet therapy. Normally it's uh, 300 milligrams of aspirin. Uh, for two weeks after the stroke, and then clopidogrel 75 milligram for, for longer than two weeks, so for lo long term basically. So yeah, um, uh, then you want to, the L stands for lipid lowering therapy, so you want to do a very high dose of atorvastatin, so 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, and then TSS stands for tobacco, sugar, and surgery. So T, you want to offer them smoking cessation, uh, sugar, you want to screen for diabetes and surgery. Um, again, carotid artery stenosis, um, you want to consider endarterectomy. That's mentioned in primary prevention, but I guess. And then, yeah, rehabilitation is really important for all stroke patients. So you want to offer them physiotherapy, occupational therapy, salt therapy, all that. So when you're looking at CT scans, it can be often very difficult to what well, some of yeah, it can be difficult to determine whether it's a bleed, a stroke, like ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so in these images, I'll just quickly go through them. So number one reveals a uh, ischemic stroke in the ACA MCA region, so an anterior circulation stroke. You can see the darker area that's dying tissue basically and a lot of that brain the frontal temporal parietal lobes as I mentioned that's now damaged because of the anterior circulation ischemia number two is an intra intracranial hemorrhage so that's a intracranial uh, like a hemorrhagic stroke um, number three here that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage subarachnoids are also considered hemorrhagic strokes um, and they have a classic five point star and then the other two, they're not considered hemorrhagic strokes. These are different. These are bleeds um, normally caused by trauma or, yeah, normally caused by trauma. And number four is an extradural hemorrhage. Um, you can see that it's bound by the suture lines. So, and then number five is um, not bound by the suture lines. It's a subdural bleed. And the this suture line concept is, it just relates to where um, the matter, so the dura matter, the, all of the different layers between the skull and the brain, they attach to the skull in different places. Um, so you can read about, up, up about that a bit um, if you want. So yeah, I'll just expand quickly on subdural versus extradural uh, bleeds. Um, so subdural bleeds are a venous bleed. It's not an arterial bleed, it's a venous bleed. So that's slower bleed. It's caused by um, normally minor head trauma. Um, and it's uh, the veins that are damaged are the bridging veins. So the veins that connect uh, the veins inside the brain to the sinuses, the venous sinuses that um, all the veins drain into. So they bridge between those two major veins. So the presentation is typically subacute, so within three days or three weeks. Um, so and yeah, it's a slow progression. So the patient will slowly develop a headache and then confusion and then slowly more severe symptoms like hemiparesis, etc. Um, so the risk factors are remembered by three E's: so elderly, epileptics, and alcoholics or ETOH, and also people who are anti on anticoagulants. Um, 
so yeah, on CT, um, it's a crescenteric shape. So the way I like to remember subdural, it has a B. So for banana, it looks like a banana on a CT scan, subdural banana. Um, treatment is, first line is burr hole craniostomy. That's just something you have to know. Um, so extra dural bleeds are, um, so they're also known as epidural bleeds. I like to call them epidural bleeds because I remember the CT images by epidural. Epi stands for pi. Pi, it looks like a pie on the on the CT scan, like more of a rounded pie shape. Um, this is an arterial bleed, so it's not a venous bleed, it's an arterial bleed in the epidural space. Um, it's caused by damage to the middle meningeal artery, normally due to blunt force trauma of the skull. Um, presentation is very pathognom or like very tip, there's a very like characteristic presentation. So you'll have a brief, brief loss of consciousness, then you'll have a lucid period where the patient is normal, and then you have rapid deterioration um, and headache. So it's sort of like a weird presentation. They'll, they'll lose consciousness and then be fine and then suddenly collapse, like very scary. Um, they'll often also have a fixed dilated pupil. Um, in normally in in um, questions they'll appear as like rugby, young rugby player presents with a loss of consciousness. Um, he was fine for a period and then deteriorated. That's sort of typical. Um, and the way you treat it is you how you would treat any sort of raised intracranial pressure presentation. So you want to give them uh, you want to hyperventilate them because hyperventilation causes um, increased, uh, reduces the CO2 levels in the blood and reduce CO2 reduces, uh, causes vasoconstriction of the cerebral arteries and vasoconstriction of the cerebral arteries will cause decreased um, intracranial pressure. You want to also elevate their head uh, to 30 degrees and you want to give them mannitol. It's not known why mannitol reduces um, intracranial pressure, but you, it works. And you want to give it via central line because mannitol has a very low half-life, short half-life. So you can't give them peripherally like in a, you know, a typical cannula. You want to give it centrally. Okay, so headaches are, oh sorry, cerebellar syndromes. This I think is more just rope learning, so I won't go through it. Just remember these two really useful mnemonics. Danish and pastry. So the features of cerebellar syndromes are Danish and then the causes are pastries. Um, yeah. A headache. Headache uh, can be an emergency. Um, so I've mentioned some of them. Uh, subdural, extradural hemorrhages, subarachnoid hemorrhages. Subarachnoid hemorrhages have a, a pathognomic thunderclap headache. So the worst headache in their life, that's a subarachnoid. Uh, temporal arteritis is a vasculitis. Uh, they present with a typical tender scalp. So they will describe it as like brushing my hair causes a lot of pain. They can also present with jaw claudication and um, amaurosis fugax, which, which was the um, TIA loss of um, monocular blindness that I described earlier. Um, and then I'll mention meningitis and encephalitis. I'll expand on that now. So meningitis and encephalitis are infections of the brain. Um, the meningitis is infection of the meninges, so the cover covering of the brain. And encephalitis is infection of the actual brain parenchyma. They will present quite differently. So meningitis, you'll have the typical neck stiffness. In children, they'll, they, they'll be angry children, crying, you know, they'll be there present. Encephalitis, however, they will be, you know, quiet with a fever um, and um, yeah, in, in older patients, they'll have weird behavior. So you can sort of clinically, they do present quite differently. So meningitis, um, I don't know if we'll show up. Oh yeah, here. So the causes of the organisms behind each meningitis depends on whether they're adu adults, immunocompromised or neonates. This is again, just rope learning, unfortunately. The adult uh, causes can be remembered by the acronym SHIN. So uh, these are the encapsulated bacteria. S stands for 
uh, streptococcus pneumonia, which will cause pneumonia, sorry, which will cause pneumococcal meningitis. H, H, H I stands for hemo Haemophilus influenza, and then N stands for Neisseria meningitis, which will cause meningococcal uh, meningitis. So Neisseria will cause meningococcal meningitis. Strep pneumo will cause pneumococcal meningitis. In immunocompromised, you'll have weird organisms causing the meningitis. So Listeria monocytogenes, Mycobacteria, Staph aureus after surgery, Cryptococcus uh, fungal infection. Neonates, you'll have either Group B strep, Listeria or E. coli. Sorry, this is just something you have to learn. Um, so um, something I have to mention, if you have a non-blanching rash, which is a typical presentation of septicemia, meningococcal septicemia, which just means that the infection in the meninges has spread to the blood, you'll have this rash. So rash actually, they say, you know, meningitis presents with some symptoms, photophobia, neck stiffness and a rash. Rash means that the infection is really serious. It's spread from the meninges to the blood. You know, that's really dangerous. But anyway, if someone with suspected meningitis presents with a rash, you don't want to do a, a lumbar puncture, no matter what. Don't do a lumbar puncture. Okay. And then um, some of the other symptoms of meningitis include Koenig sign, which it means when you extend the knee um, on a passively flexed hip um, at 90 degrees. So this first here, it causes pain. It's hard to describe. But if you want, you should ask your neuro uh, person who, how to do it, how to do it on the ward, sorry. And then Brudzinski sign is um, passive flexion of the neck um, causes pain and causes the knee flexion. So um, I guess so to mention yeah. in this, um, yeah. a passive flexion would be when the um, doctor does it for you. So a passive flexion of the hip would be forwards, extension would be backwards. Um, or you can do it while standing up. Um, yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you for adding. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, CSF interpretation is something that comes up on exams. Again, I think it's just rote learning, unfortunately. There's nothing to expand on. I think this is perfect to add on your Anki cards because there's nothing really that you have to understand about this. Um, so meningitis management. So first of all, patient presents with neck stiffness to the GP, for example. If they have a rash, the GP wants to treat it urgently. So they'll normally give IM benzyl penicillin before they even go to the hospital. So that's something you have to know. Um, so yeah, uh, any patient that presents with meningism and a rash, the, the GP will give an IM benzyl penicillin dose. Anyway, patient has now reached any. &E. Um, what do the doctors do? Well, first of all, they want to do a blood culture. If they have any signs of raised uh, intracranial pressure, so that would be, you know, neurological signs or G reduced GCS, then you don't, you want to go to the ICU immediately because they have raised intracranial pressure. You want to give them IV keftriaxone because it causes the brain blood brain barrier. You want to give them steroids and you want to make sure that they have a good airway. Um, you also want to delay the lumbar puncture until they're stable. And you want the nurse wants needs to check them uh, well, sorry, uh, you want to raise their bed to 30 degrees. Uh, if you remember, raised I ICP is treated by increasing the bed at 30 degrees. Um, so if, if they don't have evidence of raised intracranial pressure, then it's a bit less serious. So you still want senior, senior help, but you can, uh, you can carry out the lumbar puncture at this point. Um, you want to still give the IV keftriaxone. Um, and you want to give them steroids as well. Um, so if the patient is much more ill and they have evidence of septicemia, so they have a rash, for example, then you want to get, get them straight to ICU and do the sepsis 6 protocol. Um, headache um, doesn't have to be an emergency, but it also is not a normal thing. So I think a lot of people with 
headaches all their lives just think oh I just have a headache that's just how my body works no headaches are never normal um, there's different types of headaches the most common one is a tension type headache this is a bilateral headache it's non-pulsatile and it feels like a tight band is being wrapped around your head um, it's caused because the the scalp muscles are contract contracting and uh, the contraction of these muscles causes the pain. Uh, there's, you manage it by giving, uh, you know, analgesia according to the WHO pain, the WHO pain ladder. If you haven't done your anesthetics rotation, you won't know much about the, uh, the WHO pain ladder, but it comes up a lot. So just learn the WHO pain ladder. But the first step is always paracetamol or simple NSAIDs, etc. Um, but also you want to make sure that you are addressing why they have so much contractions. Normally this is because they have stress. Um, so you want to also make sure that they're treating, you know, they're dealing with their stress so you can offer, you know, acupuncture helps, but also uh, reassuring them that this is caused, this is caused because of your, uh, the contraction that helps a lot of patients as well. Um, migraine presents uh, with a typical, so if you have a migraine, it's a pulsatile type of headache that normally is unilateral. If the patient has aura, then that's confirm that confirms the diagnosis. So patient with unilateral headache that's pulsatile and also has aura, then you can diagnose it as migraine. If they don't have aura, however, they have to have had. Okay, so this is the acronym I use for migraine. 5432 Puma. So they have to have had five headaches lasting four hours to three days and two of either pulsating, unilateral, moderate to severe pain or aggravated by activity pain. So 5432 PUMA, that's um, an acronym I like to know, learn about migraine. And if they have these criteria, then you can diagnose them with uh, migraine. If they have aura, then it's a migraine. Uh, you don't need these criteria. Uh, management, you want to avoid triggers. So triggers are remembered by the acronym chocolate. So C for chocolate, H for hangover, O for OCP, C for caffeine, O for orgasms, L for alliance, A for alcohol, T for travel, and E for exercise. So you want to make sure that they're avoiding those triggers. You want to give them prophylaxis to prevent migraines, um, and that's normally propanolol. If the patient has asthma, propanol is contraindicated, so you want to give them topiramate instead. And if they're of childbearing age, so between so between like around 16 to 40, you want to give them amitriptyline instead of topiramate. So number one is propanolol for prevention. If they're asthmatic, you want to give them topiramate. And if they're childbearing age, you want to give them amitriptyline. In acute attacks, uh, you want to give them um, paracetamol and uh, triptans. Triptan should be taken once the headache starts, not when the aura is starting. So normally you'll have an aura and headache. You want to give it. Uh, sorry, you want to give it when the headache starts, not when the aura starts. That's something that comes up with in exams. Um, and females with migraine should stop taking the con combined oral contraceptive pill because it increases the risk of ischemic stroke if they have migraine with aura. Um, cluster headaches are just um, a type of headache where there's pain around the eye and lacrimation. The episodes last long, less than 90 minutes and you want to treat it acutely by giving oxygen 100% and triptans subcutaneously. And you can give them prophylaxis uh, verampamil as well to prevent cluster headaches. And then finally, uh, for my section, uh, you're an ST3 working in general practice. Just a, a 22 second. year old. Um, so um, for pregnant women, I think you can give propranolol first, but I mean, triptyline would be second line. Um, basically, oh. don't give pyramid. And I guess a common condition to mention in this is medication overuse headaches. Um, which are commonly associated with triptans and opioids. Yeah. Um, so in these, uh, you'd, uh, you'd probably get some question on this. Um, so it's when the headache is present for more than 15 days a month. 
um, and the management for that would be um, you ask them to take simple NLG uh, G6 and uh, Kryptons to stop taking that ab abruptly, but you wean yeah. down opioids over time. Just to, to Great, thank you so much for covering that. Yeah, that's definitely something that comes up as well. So medication overuse headaches, something that you should read up on after this presentation. Um, so yeah, you're an ST3 working in a GP. A 22-year-old female visits the practice for medication review. Uh, her consultant neurologist has asked you to prescribe prophylactic therapy for recently diagnosed migraine, for which she experiences an aura. She currently takes Yasmin and Salbutamol for asthma. What is the most appropriate plan of action? So this sort of summarizes what we've mentioned about analgesia control in migraines. This patient has migraine, is on the pill, and has asthma. So the best treatment for her would be to pyramid because um, she has asthma, so she can't take uh, propanolol. And then you want to switch the asthma to the pop. Okay, that's all for my section. Thank you very much for looking at that. I think, Tiana, you're taking over. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. See you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Um, okay, guys, so I'm just going to um, now be talking about epilepsy. Um, so we can see the classification here. Um, broadly, it's split into two categories, focal and generalized. Um, so generalized involves both hemispheres of the brain and focal used to be called partial, but now they're now called focal um, localizes to one lobe and focal um, seizures normally have um, aura associated with them. Um, so generalized seizures involve both sides of the brain and they always involve a loss of consciousness. So we don't need to split them into simple or complex. Whereas for focal seizures, they can be um, simple or complex, depending on the level of awareness at the um, seizure. Um, so we can use some, oh, can you go back as well? Sorry. Um, um, so we can see some of the features below that help us to localize where a seizure might be. Um, so, sort of automatisms like muscle movements that are repetitive, hallucinations and emotional um, sort of experiences, we can localize and say that these are temporal. Um, and then there's also something called Jacksonian March, uh, which is very common in frontal lobe seizures. And that essentially is when the seizure starts in one part of the body and it moves um, progressively throughout different muscle groups. Um, okay, so definitely I would say learn all of those. Um, and then in the top, in the bottom left corner, it mentions uh, pseudo seizures. I was just going to say that we don't really use that term anymore. We now say non epileptic seizures. Um, and it's also worth noting that seizures can start as focal and then become generalized, which is called a focal to bilateral seizure. Okay. Um, yeah, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so this is further splitting the generalized seizures into different types. So we've got you do have tonic and you have clonic and then you have tonic clonic which is um more common um so that has a very um strong contraction phase where all the muscles contract in the body as seen in the picture above um and then in the clonic phase they uh relax and then this is repeated um very violently at a frequency of about um i think th three to five hertz I'll, I'll have to double check that um Okay, so there's also myoclonic, atonic, and absence seizures. <coughs> People who have absence seizures can have them up to like tens of times a day. So um, it's quite typical. So a teacher would comment on a student sort of daydreaming or dazing out. Um, and because this is happening so often and the child isn't aware, this can be quite severe on their learning. Um, it, is, it isn't just a few seconds of daydreaming. It's like consistently throughout the day, every single day. That's what true absence seizure is. Um, and then below that in the table, we can see the um, first line treatments for different seizure types. Um, so for absence, either succinamide is the first line. Um, carbamazepine or lamotrigine are more commonly used for focal seizures. And valproet or lamotrigine is used for generalized seizures. Um, <coughs> um, and then we can also see some common causes that we need to consider when thinking about um, seizures. And the first one at the top of the list is hypoglycemia. 
Um, you've probably heard the acronym, don't ever forget glucose. Um, so anytime someone is seizing or a seizure is suspected, the first thing you would immediately do in any setting is check for glucose because it's the easiest thing to correct. Um, and then it saves you having to give all of these potentially toxic medications that aren't needed. Uh, the other infections are herpes and cephalitis, psychogenic, which is what I was mentioning about pseudo seizures, non epileptic seizures, space occupying lesions, um, an epileptic disorder, and alcohol withdrawal. Um, okay, yeah, you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, I think uh, in recent NICE guidelines, so for generalized, generally speaking, you give valproate for men and lamotrigine or levetiracetam for women. I think there's some slight um, changes with myoclonic seizures, but you can look that up in your own time. Mm. And valproate is um, very dangerous to use in pregnancy. <coughs> As we can see here, um, it says to completely avoid it. Um, so these are some of the other side effects put into an acronym. Um, phenytoin similarly is also very dangerous to use in pregnancy. So um, most of the epileptic drugs in general are quite dangerous, but you're balancing up the risk benefit depending on how bad the seizures are. Uh, as a general rule, the safest one is um, levetiracetam. Um, Lamotrigine is also safe, but there are still some concerns over it. And usually we typically use one drug at a time in epilepsy because we want to reduce the risk of interactions. And one also one other thing about phenytoin that's worth looking up is um, fetal hydantoin syndrome. Um, because the drug is so ter teratogenic, uh, it's associated with this condition that um, <coughs> essentially consists of cleft palate, hyperplastic phalanges and microcephaly. Uh, so that's worth looking into. And the fact that it's a P450 inducer means that um, you also need to do a very stringent um, medication check and see what may or may not be interacting. Um, in particular, sort of the contraceptive pill, if a patient's on that, then that is reduced by um, quite a few of the epileptic drugs. Um, okay, can you move on to the next slide, please, Sinal? <laughs> okay, so I'll give you guys a minute to read this. You can put your answer on the chat. Just, uh, Feel free to, uh... If you want to have a go. OK, um, I'll just move on. Um, this is really something you have to rote learn the side effects associated with each of the drugs. <coughs> and it's very, it's very tricky because there's quite a lot of overlap. Um, oh, can you go back to, yeah. So the answer is to pyramate. Um, this is associated with renal stones, um, whereas the other four are not. And there's a little reminder at the bottom about that pro to pyramate and how that sort of, um, combination means that you should avoid it in childbearing women. Um, okay, yeah, and as I was saying, um, phenytoin is very teratogenic, so that can lead to fetal hydantoin syndrome. <coughs> okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, I'll give you guys another minute to read that as well. Any guesses? Okay. Um, so the answer here is start the clock. <coughs> and yeah, this is quite tricky because it, um, all of these options are um, very much valid. The typical guideline is to give two doses of benzodiazepine. 
And then, and then if there is no response to that, then we go on to consider phenytoin infusion. And then if that doesn't work, we then bleep the anesthetist um, because intubation is likely to be necessary. Okay, so normally we say after five minutes of a seizure, then we give the benzodiazepine, but obviously it takes some time for it for it to be um, drawn up and double checked. Um, so that is likely to just sort of be started as soon as the person starts seizing, depending on the situation that you're in. Um, and the reason for the five minute mark is because it's um, been proven that after five minutes, um, the seizure is likely to not terminate by itself. Okay. Um, so in terms of the other options, the thiamine and glucose isn't is um, important because that's what you would want to do to pre prevent alcohol withdrawal um, seizures and course curves. Um, but it is in the most immediate action. Um, benzodiazepines are the first line. Um, <coughs> okay, next slide, please. Oh, going back. Yeah, sorry. No, for this one, it's fine. Um, one acronym that I like to use for remembering this is, oh my lord, phone the anaesthetist. So the O is for oxygen, just um, reminds you to sort of maintain their airway and check if if they're in a hospital setting, they might be desaturating and then um, they can give an oxygen. M is for midazolam, L is for lorazepam, um, P is for phenytoin, and then A is for anaesthetist, if none of those have worked. So... Um, <coughs> Status epilepticus is um, what we call when the seizures have been um, carrying on for over 30 minutes. Sorry, over five minutes, I think it would be status. And then, sorry, 30 minutes, yeah. Um, or if they've had multiple seizures, but in that time they've not regained consciousness. Um, so um, yeah, lorazepam, lorazepam, and then phenytoin. Um, if you're in a hospital setting, then you can give IV drugs, <coughs> but in a home setting or in the community, um, buccal midazolam is a safer option, um, or rectal diazepam, potentially, but usually buccal is, um, your first line. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Any guesses for this one? Okay. Um, the answer, please. <coughs> so the answer here is an MRI of the head, um, because we want to visualize any periventricular demyelination, um, as this will give us a diagnosis of MS, multiple sclerosis. Um, so the first option, stool sample, is um, hinting at Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, but this is a chronic condition, so it's unlikely to be um, GBS, as that um, comes on very acutely. <coughs> so that stool sample is checking for the Campylobacter um, bacteria, which is associated with um, GBS. Um, electromyography is more looking at sort of <coughs> my stenogravis or myositis or that sort of thing. Um, D is um, very, very specific. Devich's disease, um, which is associated with anti and 4 antibodies. Um, so, yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? MS is um, a chronic demyelinating autoimmune condition um, that affects the nervous system. And these lesions are disseminated in time and space. So um, the relapsing remitting form of this disease is the most common um, and 85% of patients have this form. And the other less common forms are secondary progressive, primary progressive and progressive relapsing. So um, I'd urge you to look into the McDonald criteria for um, how we diagnose MS. It, ha it affects multiple systems. So visual sim systems, visual um, symptoms are the most commonly um, complained about feature, um, particularly pain around the eyes, um, optic neuritis, 
um, optic atrophy, so visual um, fatigue and blurriness of vision. Um, sensory symptoms include pins and needles, numbness and trigeminal neuralgia and weakness in the legs. Um, in terms of the cerebellar system, um, in a relapse, it's quite common to see ataxia. <coughs> but this normally isn't part of the long term um, progression of the disease. Um, and then it's also quite common to see um, autonomic involvement, such as urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction, lethargy, um, impacts on um, uh, cognition, intellectual ability and mood um, can also be seen in MS. Um, your classic exam question will give you sort of like a 35 year old um, woman. That is the most common demographic. <coughs> and yeah, there are also a couple of signs that are um, pathognomonic for MS. Um, so one of them is Lermit's sign, um, which essentially sends you get electric shocks down the spine um, when neck flexion happens. <coughs> and then there's another phenomenon that is called Untoff's phenomenon, um, which is when the symptoms get worse, especially the visual symptoms when exposed to heat. So in an exam question, you would see um, the patient complaining that when they come out of the bath, um, the symptoms are worse. So can you go to the next slide, please? Um, the way we manage MS is by managing relapses when they happen, and that's done with steroid treatment for five days, uh, methylprednisolone. Um, and then there are maintenance therapies that sort of modify the course of the disease. <coughs> so the first line for that is natalizumab. Um, that's an anti-alpha-4, beta-1 integrin. Um, ocrelizumab is also another monoclonal antibody that is used for maintenance therapy. Um, and with steroids for the relapse, they uh, they reduce the duration of the relapse, but they don't actually improve the prognosis of the disease. Um, but we've seen quite a lot of success with datalizumab for um, doing that. And then there are also some specific concerns that we target with um, specific drugs. So fatigue, we go to amantadine, um, as well as um, CPD, CBT um, and mindfulness therapies um, to manage the psychological effects of the disease. Um, for spasticity, we give baclofen and gabapentin. Um, and we've also been looking into Botox and um, some other um, drugs such as cannabis. Um, so it's typical with the attacks for you to have one to two months um, of an acute attack and followed by a period of remission. Um, it is possible for these um, varieties of MS to sort of change into the other. So um, secondary progressive MS involves that. Um, bladder dysfunction is also one thing that um, is managed as its own thing. So we normally do an ultrasound of the bladder first to see if there's any um, urinary retention. <coughs> if there is quite a lot, then we would normally catheterize the patient. Um, if there isn't a lot, then we would consider anticholinergics. Um, to help improve um, frequency of urine. Um, and then also um, oscillation of the visual fields is um, quite a common complaint. Um, and we use gabapentin to help with that as well. Next slide, please. Um, which of the following findings would you not expect in my senior gravis? Okay, um, you can go to the answer, please. So the answer is rimmed vacuoles and muscle biopsy. Um, so this is a hallmark of inclusion body myositis. And remember, myasthenia gravis is a disorder of the neuromuscular junction um, due to a reduction in the number of functioning acetylcholine receptors. So the muscle itself um, isn't affected <coughs> directly as part of the disease process. Um, and going through some of these other options, um, B, thymic hyperplasia or thymoma, that's very common. So in about 15% of patients, we would see um, thymomas. Um, and normally we would do thymectomies to remove these. 
Um, the tensilin test isn't really done anymore because of its association with um, causing cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so here is um, just an overview of some um, neuromuscular junction disorders. So the MG is for myasthenia gravis and is comparing it to <coughs> Lambert Ethan, um, myasthenia syndrome. Um, so that is a condition that is similar to myasthenia gravis um, that's often associated with small cell lung cancer. Um, it shows a similar level of fatigability, but classically when you do um, electromyography and you've got repetitive stimulation, that will increase the muscle function over time. Um, this does eventually wane, um, but initially that is how you distinguish. Um, yeah, so eyes are more commonly affected in myasthenia gravis and not in Lambert Eaton. Um, yeah, EMG incre incremental in Lambert Eaton um, and decremental in um, myasthenia. And in terms of treatment, um, we use anticholinesterase inhibitors for myasthenia gravis. So that is pyridostigmine as the first line. Um, and the image seen on the um, bottom right here is um, a CT thorax, so that shows a thymoma. <coughs> okay, um, so the thing that we're most worried about with um, myasthenia gravis is a myasthenic crisis um, because that increases the risk of respiratory depression. Um, and the way that we treat this is by plasmapheresis with or without intravenous immunoglobulin. Um, okay, next slide, please. So, thymogens are often associated with myasthenia gravis. Um, a treatment often for it is thymectomy, which does have positive outcomes. Actually, wait, just before you move on, can we go back, please? Um, so, the antibody is directed, the main difference between myasthenia gravis and Lambert Eaton syndrome um, is that in myasthenia gravis, the antibody is directed against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Um, whereas in Lambert Eaton is, is directed against the voltage gated calcium channel. Um, so that's really the main thing. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. Okay. Any answers for this one? Okay, can you show the answer, please, Sino? <coughs> um, so for this one, I think is um, more of a process of elimination. Um, so we're not given any indication that she has diabetes here um, from the medical history. Um, we're not in given any indication that there's pain, which rules out C. Um, autonomic neuropathy, we would see other, other features such as um, urinary incontinence or tachycardia. Um, and yeah, in, sem in symmetrical sensory neuropathy, we get um, vibration sense loss first, um, pain and temperature sensation lost in a glove and stocking pattern. Um, and at the later stages, this can lead to loss of balance. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, this is a classification of um, neuropathies. So we're split into predominantly motor and sensory. Um, the ones I would say are most important to learn about in the motor section are definitely Guillain-Barre and also Schalke Marie Tooth as well. Um, diphtheria porphyria and um, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, um, less common, so in less detail. Um, and then in the sensory side, I would say uh, the first three for sure. And can anyone tell me what the um, picture is showing, what sign that is? So that's what we call Burton's line. It's the blue pigmentation of the gums, and that is associated with chronic lead intoxi 
lead intoxication. Um, and the B12 deficiency is also pointed for subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord, um, a condition that is definitely worth learning. Um, and uh, the features of that are spastic paralysis, loss of vibration sense, but pain and temperature sense is intact. And there's also a mixture of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron features. Um, Okay, next slide, please. I think this is the last one for me. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, it is an acute immune-mediated ascending demyelination of the peripheral nervous system. <coughs> um, more than half of people initially get pain in their limbs and back, but the main feature of this condition is weakness and reduced reflexes. Um, there's also an, an association with infection, specifically Campylobacter jejuni, um, because there's like a cross reaction of the antibodies formed um, that then go on to attack the ganglicides in the peripheral nerves. Um, <coughs> so this is diagnosed by lumbar puncture. We see high protein levels with normal white cell count, so um, that shows us that there's not an infectious process. <coughs> And also no conduction studies. Um, so the main way that we manage this is by plasma exchange or IVIG. Um, so that just um, sort of removes the antibodies from the blood. Um, and one thing that we have to always monitor for this is respiratory failure. So we do serial peak flows and we um, make sure the patient maintains control of their airway, make sure their swallowing is safe. Um, and that sort of thing. Um, so there's also mild sensory symptoms associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome. So um, this is sort of uh, tingling, um, paresthesia, especially in the lower limbs. Um, there can be cranial nerve involvement and autonomic involvement. Um, these are less common. And anti-GM1 antibodies are seen in 25% of people with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, <coughs> there's also a variant called Miller-Fisher syndrome, which is classically descending rather than ascending. Um, it is more focused on the eyes, so it's got um, ophthalmoplegia as well as areflexia and ataxia. <coughs> and that's associated with anti-GQ1B antibodies instead of anti-GM1. Okay, next slide please. Um, so for this, even though lumbar puncture is probably more, more likely what you do first, um, electromyography, so nerve conduction studies are diagnostic, and that's often a question. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we, uh, can you guys fill in this feedback form? And so um, everybody who watched this on recording as well, could you fill in as well? Uh, it would help us out a lot. So I'll leave this slide here for one to two minutes and then we'll move on. Hi, uh, would you be able to email the slides out uh, to my email so I can like, go through this in my own time? There's a lot um, of information. We will, yeah, we'll share a slide um, containing all the slides um, through Mensoc. Like, so you'll have, get access to all the slides. Uh, how can I access it? Um, I'll double check with the rest of the committee, but you should get it soon. Would you also just at the end just be able to email it out to my email as well? I've just provided it in the comment section. OK, sure. please. I can do that. Thank yeah, you. yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have you, can you see my email? In the comment section. Um, I like to check the actual team shot. OK, that's fine. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, so it should be zchama7 at ucl.ac.uk. Yeah, sure. I can read that. Thank you.
Also, Sunil, one thing about um, this Google form is that I think it still has the names from last year on it. Okay, is this the old one? Um, yeah, just press neurology anyway, and, and that's fine, right? Yeah. Did you, no, uh, you checked here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll I'll put the actual feedback form in the chat. So that's it. Um, you should you guys should be able to see it on the chat when you click the link. Okay, I'll go through the rest of the conditions now. Um, so let's start with Parkinson's disease. Um, so as you guys know, may know from second year, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative condition, which is caused by degeneration of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So you can see the triangle, the triad on the left, showing bradykinesia, hypertonia, and resting tremor. So bradykinesia can manifest in shuffling gait and freezing. Hypomimia is the lack of facial expressions. Hypertonia can uh, cause lead pipe or cogwheel rigidity. Um, so uh, that would be where you keep freezing when you're like flexing your hand, for example. Um, resting tremor would be pill rolling. So it'd be like this. It'd be like, it'd literally be like somebody rolling a pill. And reemergent basically means it um, once the patient assumes a horizontal posture like this, um, it reappears in a finite period of time. Um, you can see the causes on the top right. So it's usually idiopathic, but it can manifest because of drug, uh, drugs. Um, drug call, um, Parkinson's caused by drugs are generally um, symmetrical, whilst Parkinson's disease is usually asymmetrical. Um, and it can also be caused by traumas and genetic conditions and Parkinson's plus syndromes, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, Parkinsonism would be a, that basically describes the range of diseases that share the similar symptoms of Parkinson's disease, whilst Parkinson's disease is specifically degeneration of the neurons of the substantia nigra. Okay. Um, give you guys just a minute to read this. Feel free to put the answer in the chat. Okay, so the answer is dopamine agonist. Um, basically, uh, he's been trying out um, levodopa for three years, so you need to move on to second line treatment. Um, you can either give dopamine agonist a, a MAU-B inhibitor or a COMT inhibitor. You usually stick with the uh, former two. Um, and dopamine agonist is the only one on this list, and it's usually the one you give just by NAS guidelines. Um, 
Yeah, okay, that's the next question. Um, so Levidofa is something you need to remember. For example, in OSCEs, so they might ask you to explain Levidofa to a cognitive disease patient that's a drug explaining station. So you, uh, you should remember the side effects. I always uh, based on my OSCE station with the mnemonic athletics. You can Google that. Um, for the Levidofa side effects, I use this mnemonic, which I'll share in the chat, but it's basically um, Levidopa, so lethargy, euphoria slash excess, excessive daytime somnolence, so sleepiness, vomiting, orthostatic hypertension, uh, deletion, delirium, grinders, dyskinesia, on off phenomena. Um, so, on off phenomena is when the uh, body gets used to uh, levidopa. Um, it lasts for a shorter period of time. So, you get periods where it works and periods where it doesn't. Um, priapism, um, psychosis, and athetosis. I'll share that in the chat. So in this particular question, um, postural hypertension is um, indicated by the symptoms of blacking out. We'll cover the bed at the bottom in the next couple of slides. So Parkinson's management um, this is generally um, done by NICE guidelines. Um, so whether the symptoms are impacting the quality of life, and um, if the symptoms are, you give levodopa along with carbidopa. Um, you give carbidopa um, to basically um, allow, uh, allow the. I forgot. What was that time? It's something to do with the blood, blood brain barrier. Let me check. Yeah, fine. Um, so you want levodopa to cross the blood brain barrier. Um, so carbidopa prevents the breakdown of levodopa until it does. That's what you get. Um, if it isn't affecting the quality of life, um, the Parkinson's disease, then you give a dopamine agonist or a MAO-B inhibitor um, because it generally has less side effects than levodopa. Um, the drugs mentioned at the bottom is, so we can go through it, uh, COMT inhibitor, that's an alternative to dopamine agonist or MAO-B inhibitor. Um, Apomorphine is for the on-off side effect that I mentioned. It's actually used as a rescue medication. Um, and for drug induced Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's, uh, which manifests asymmetrical um, Parkinsonian symptoms, um, you can give anti muscarinics. Um, generally avoided in elderly, it can lead to confusion among various other things like urological problems, bladder incontinence, etc. This is Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, so, multiple system atrophy. Um, is when you get Parkinsonian symptoms. So all of these, you get Parkinsonian symptoms along with something else. So for MSA, you get autonomic symptoms as well, um, such as incontinence, um, cerebellar signs. Um, by the hot cross bun, what that is basically pointing to is if you can see the pawns. I don't know if I, there's a way for me to write on this. That's a laser pointer. Oh, yeah. So this is the pawns. And you can see this line. That's what the hot cross bone sign is. Progressive supranuclear palsy is loss of vertical gaze, um, postural instability, and gunslinger gait. So gunslinger gait is basically a broad-based gait, um, which looks like a gunslinger. Um, so it's basically a broad-based gait with knees and trunk extended and arms slightly abducted. Um, then cortico basal dis, uh, degeneration. So it's an alien limb. So um, the uh, patient genuinely feels like um, the
Yeah, uh, the uh, they can't control a part of their body along with dementia. Um, so um, there may be spontaneous activity of a affected limb or um, a kinetic rigidity, so they can't uh, move it. Then you get Lewy body dementia, which is um, a type of dementia, but you get Parkinsonian symptoms along with it. You get hallucinations, but we'll cover this in a later slide. Um, you can give acetylcholine esterase inhibitors for this, um, as shown there. Um, a common differential for MSA is normal pressure hydrocephalus, which you can remember by the mnemonic, uh, well, uh, the phrase wet wobbly wacky, so a urinary incontinence, wacky dementia slash confusion, um, wobbly and abnormal gait. Moving on to this question. Um, so a 68 year old woman is taken to our GP by a concerned husband. She has become more withdrawn and no longer wants to do her gardening. He notes that she often forgets to brush her teeth and she sometimes struggles to find the right word. He was surprised to come home last week to find her naked and urinating in the living room. Ex smoker hypertension. So this is the answer. Um, so there's different types of dementia, which we'll cover in the next slide, but in firm to temporal lobe dementia, um, there generally isn't dementia symptoms in the classical uh, perception of the word. Um, it's more personality changes. Um, as it says there, it's usually insidious onset of happens less than 65 years old. Um, and there's often um, personality changes, social problems, disinhibition. So moving on. Um, I'll actually share a mnemonic that I have. It's um, there are other other things that can cause dementia. Um, the, the mnemonic is dementia. But that's when I use this various ones on the internet. Um, but there's things from Huntington's endocrine problems, metabolic B12 deficiency, for example, alcohol, brain tumors, subdural hematoma, infection like HIV, cephalus. They can all, all, all have neurological effects, like depression, normal pressure hydrocephalus, which we covered in the previous slide. Um, so um, with this, um, the first uh, dementia that most people think of is Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's usually um, so there's uh, two types of changes that happen in the body. One is macroscopic. So there's macroscopic widespread cerebral atrophy. Um, so on brain imaging, you'd see narrowing of, of the cerebral gyri and widening of the sulci. Gyri is the lobe, sulci is the spaces between. Um, and the microscopic changes would be beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Those are the two classical things that you hear. The tangles are caused by tau protein uh, hyperphosphorylation, which leads to aggregation of the tau protein in uh, focal areas of the brain. Um, you, uh, the way I uh, remember the symptoms of Alzheimer's, that's by the five A's. Of course, there are the, the, the other features apart from these, but it covers most of the ones you find in exam questions. I'll put that on the chat as well. So um, the five A's are amnesia, aphasia, agnosia. Agnosia is recognition problems, apraxia, which is the inability to carry out skill tasks, and anomia, which is uh, word recall problems. Um, then you have vascular dementia, which has risk factors similar to stroke or ischemic heart disease. And the drug treatments that would otherwise work on Al Alzheimer's, um, I forgot to mention. So um, Alzheimer's drug treatments that would work would be a stalcarine esterase inhibitors as first line or a second line. Combined with conservative management, like cognitive rem reminiscence therapy, um, massive uh, social MDT support, um, uh, a risk assessment of how they are at home. Um, we'll cover all this, but um, you need to mention all that in an OSCE, um, like a holistic approach thing. Um, so 
yeah, like back to vascular dementia. So those drugs wouldn't work, work on vascular dementia. So the main management is to control the risk factors. Um, if that's comorbid um, Alzheimer's disease, so a mix of both, you can use the drugs. Um, but obviously that would be under a specialist and it depends on the case. Um, for Lewy body dementia, uh, Parkinsonism plus visual hallucinations, children running, running around is a common exam question, uh, plus dementia, cognitive decline. Um, more in attention and executive function rather than memory, but memory is certainly affected too in time. Um, so then frontotemporal, um, we covered one type of it in the previous question, but frontotemporal lobe degeneration, um, that's uh, as actually as three diseases associated with it. Um, all have insidious onset before 65. Preserved memory and visuospatial skills, but more personality changes. So the first of that is prefrontotemporal dementia, which is otherwise known as Pick's disease, uh, which you saw in the previous question, which um, things like uh, personality change, disinhibition, hyperorality, increased appetite. And um, on an MRI, you'd see gyral atrophy with a knife blade appearance. You can, it's an, uh, a famous, um, I think, you can see on exam questions again. Um, so the second type would be progressive non-fluent aphasia, otherwise known as chronic progressive aphasia, CPA, um, which is an, uh, characterized by non-fluent short occurrences. It's similar to, you can think of it similar to Broca's aphasia, for example. Um, so it's non-fluent. They can't speak fluently, yeah. Um, the third type is cement, semantic dementia, which is fluent progressive aphasia, which you can think of similar to Wernicke's aphasia. Okay, moving on to cranial nerve policies. Um, so cranial nerves, um, we'll do the ocular nerves first. So uh, this third nerve is oculomotor nerve. Um, which would cause a down and out people. Those images are in order. Um, so you'd see ptosis um, as the LPS, the levator palpebra superior, superioris is impaired. Um, and uh, you'd see dilation, i.e. midriasis, as the parasympathetic fibers are responsible for the constriction. So they're not supplied anymore. So the eye dilates. Um, and the eyes are deviated down and out because if the ocular motor nerve is impaired, then only the superior oblique and lateral rectus muscle um, is functioning. So um, related to four and six. So superior oblique, what it does is it primarily internally rotates the eye, i.e. intort the eye. And the secondary and tertiary functions would be depresses and abducts the eye, uh, respectively, which um, for a uh, fourth nerve palsy would cause a vertical diplopia. Well, patients may develop a head tilt to balance the field of view. And then the lateral rectus muscle, um, which abducts the eye. So if for a sixth nerve palsy, the eye, the eye would be adducted at rest, causing a horizontal diplopia. It mentions here the difference between um, surgical and clinical. Mm -hmm. So for medical policy, um, you don't often get the midriasis. For surgical, you do. And those are the causes you can see. Um, often it's painful as well, along with the midriasis. Um, it's also called a Hutchinson's, pup Hutchinson's pupil, um, which is associated with some spinal cord lesions, which I can't remember. Um, fine, anything else? Okay, moving on to uh, the facial nerve. Um, so for, so this is kind of split into upper and lower motor neuron signs. So for upper motor neuron um, lesions, um, you would usually get forehead sparing. Um, so what happens is this affects, um, so an upper motor neuron lesion, such as a stroke, would affect the contralateral lower face and it spares the upper face because the upper face is innervated by both sides of the brain whilst the lower face isn't. Um, and in terms of lower motor neuron lesions like Bell's palsy, um, um, there's a lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve. So the ipsilateral face is affected. So upper, uh, so upper motor neuron would be contralateral lower face. Um, the lower motor neuron lesion, the Bell's palsy would be the ipsilateral face, but in both sides of the face because there wouldn't be any forward sparing. Um, 
and it's as you uh, other symptoms of Bell's palsy, such as facial weakness, ear pain, uh, difficulty chewing and closing eyes, um, and you manage mm -hmm. it with um, redness alone. Some people did used to give a cyclovir, but I think for current NICE guidelines, this is purely prednisolone. Um, Ramsey Hunt syndrome is um, similar to Bell's palsy, um, but you also get a vesicular rash around the ear. Um, the auricular pain is usually the first feature. You get the facial nerve palsy, you also get vertigo and tinnitus. Um, and it's managed by oral acyclovir and corticosteroids. Um, and then there's Lyme disease. Um, this is kind of going into infectious disease, I guess. Um, but it has a lot of features and it progresses over time. Um, it's associated with tick bite. You get a bullseye rash called erythema migrans. Uh, there'll be systemic features. Um, and later on, you'd get cardiovascular and neurological features. And their neurological features in the late stages, stage two and three, would be facial nerve palsy. Um, and then stage three would be dementia, polyneuropathies, encephalomyelitis. Um, you do LSA to diagnose it, and you'd treat it with doxycycline if it's early. But if it's disseminated disease, you do use uh, IV ceftriaxone. So these are brain tumors. Um, they won't ask you much about brain tumors, I think, but the most likely thing they're going to ask you is to, they'll give you an image and say what brain tumor is it. You can see on the top right, that's glioblastoma multiform, which is the most prime, common primary tumor in adults. Um, the second most common primary tumor in adults would be a meningioma, which arrive from the dura mater of the brain. So those would be around the edges, usually, of the CT or MRI image, MRI usually. Um, Glioblastoma is associated with a small prognosis. You can see it's a solid circ uh, circumferential tumor with central necrosis, enhancing or invasogenic edema, edema, meaning you can see the kind of darker hypo, um, hypo dense, hypotense areas around the uh, tumor. Um, for MRI, you'd say hypo dense and hyper dense for CT, you'd say hyper intense, hyper intense, but it doesn't really matter. For pituitary adenoma, um, you often see it associated with bitemporal hemianopia. Um, so it would, it's um, the, the two things that can cause by, um, it's either a pituitary adenoma or a craniopharyngioma, um, which is another tumor, but that's generally, um, uh, you only get it in children. It would be very rare to get it in um, adults. The pituitary adenoma can be secretory or non-secretory. It can secrete most, uh, obviously that's, uh, I think there's um, hormones that secretes more uh, of, um, of the, uh, it's more likely to secrete some of the hormones than others. Um, I think the most common type is um, non-secretory, which would cause hypopituitarism. Um, the investigations you'd have to be um, for pituitary and brain imaging, of course. Um, and it's usually managed by um, either dopamine agonists, which would inhibit um, the pituitary. Um, um, so that'd be a pro prolactinoma if it's a prolactinoma. Um, but otherwise, it'd be neurosurgical yeah. intervention, transferenoidal approach, you've resected. Um, vestibular schwannoma is another um, tumor mm -hmm. thing, um, arising from the eighth cranial nerve, vestibular popular nerve, often seen in the cerebral point of angle, that's so on. Um, the one. adenoma is the one in the bottom image, but vestibular schwannoma you can't see here. Mm -hmm. That's um, that's the, uh, so vegetable schwannoma, um, you it what it basically does is it affects the fifth, seventh, and eighth cranial. Um, so you get an absent corneal reflex. 
um, because of uh, it affecting the trigeminal nerve. Um, you would get facial palsy, facial nerve, and vestibular cochlear nerve, vertigo, unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, unilateral tinnitus, neurofibrin mitosis type 2. It's often associated with bilateral vestibular channel, uh, which we'll get onto actually. Um, so this is spot diagnosis. I'll give you guys 30 seconds to just take a guess at this. Yeah, so this is tuberous fibrosis. It often has quite a few overlapping symptoms. It's neurofibrinitosis. I think that's a Venn diagram of past time, which I would recommend memorizing. What about neurocutaneous disorders? Have so many um, The AASF, so aspirin, aspirin, spots, adenoma, sedation, chagrin, patches, algorithm, golf, fibromata. Those are all dermatological. Um, probably in the country, I do here. But um, worth being aware of at the very least. Um, tuberous sclerosis, you often see it associated with epilepsy and developmental problems, um, especially in pediatric cases. I could guess what this is, right? So this is there's a bilateral vestibular schwannomas, um, which is associated with neurofibrinitosis type two. Um, you often get um, it's also associated with meningiomas, juvenile onset cataracts, um, a few cafe or late spots, um, but that's more present in type one. Um, neurofibrinitosis in general, um, you get ot ocular hematomas. Um, which is dermatological kind of thing. Um, in both neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis. But in tuberous sclerosis, you get a retinal hematoma. In neurofibromatosis, you get more high risk. Yeah, so this is on a syndrome. Um, it's not actually a real anophthalmos, it's a fake, fake anophthalmos. It appears that way. It's not actually a sunken eye, but you can say on a syndrome. You often get heterochromia as well, so different they call it phase. Um there's a variety of things that can cause on a syndrome. Um, and depending on what causes it. It actually affects what symptoms for each of these get, which we'll cover in off cell. Um, in central lesions, for example, um, like a stroke, you'd get an hydrosis of the face, arm, and trunk. It's an hydrosis that you know, actually uh, the best way to differentiate them. In preganglionic lesions, um, like coma or a pancos tumor, you get an hydrosis of the face. And if you don't get an hydrosis, it's um, a postganglionic lesion like a carotid artery dissection or a cavernous sinus thrombosis or a carotid aneurysm, usually the vessels. Um, okay, I guess what this is, guys. Yeah, so this is Chakumari tooth disease. The most common hereditary peripheral neuropathy. 50% um, inheritance rate. Um, so it results uh, predominantly in um, uh, motor loss. There's no cure, so management is focused on physical and occupational therapy. Um, like the, uh, there's usually bilateral symptoms um, associated with pain. 
um, you can also get permanent sensory loss. You get, can get a um, the stock leg deformity, as you can see there, where uh, they're pointed towards each other. Um, you can get high arched feet, pascabus. Uh, you can get um, sort of distal muscle weakness, hyporeflexia. You often diagnosed by nerve conduction studies or genetic testing.